You're listening to the Orange Power Podcast, a product of Oklahoma State Athletics. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to our Orange Power Podcast. we got a great show, and we're going to start with another sweep by Cowgirl Softball. Joining us now, the head coach for the Cowgirls, Coach Kenny Gajewski. And Coach, congratulations on an outstanding week, another great week. You guys just keep rolling right now. Playing good. This team is starting to really find its groove, and, and uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch and be a part of, and, and uh, good things are going down. You know, it is fun to be a part of, as, as distant as I am to even be close to a part of it. It has been so much fun. Um, this weekend was going to be such a telling tale about where you're going to finish. What's that last series going to mean? Where do you guys compare to Texas? And, I mean... The answers were, were there in front of us. Three straight wins, um, just a really good weekend. Yeah, we just continued to be led by our, our uh, pitching, you know, and it was really cool to watch all three of our kids get a win. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Kelly uh, uh, got us going and, and had a really good performance, had to adjust her game plan, thought that Texas had a really good performance um, or a real, really good plan against her. Mm-hmm. So she had to adjust and, and start throwing a little bit down and that opened her rise ball right back up. Uh, but you got to have those tools to be able to do that and the confidence to do it in a, um, high level game against a high level, level team. And then obviously Ellis, um, or w- then let's, let's go back. Julia had the big, mm-hmm. the big walk off po- home run. So it was really good f- for, for her. She's been grinding and pushing through some some really tough stuff so it's been great and then you know you look at Elish and her per- performance with everything that's going on with her and her history with Texas and then to be able to throw Morgan Day I've been telling everyone for a long time she's really good she's just not getting enough opportunities and it's great to be able to run her out there well and so let's let's delve in a little bit deeper all right so Friday night uh, again Kelly Maxwell it pitches brilliantly and it goes extra innings. I mean, that was one of those games where you just felt like it was almost a battle of, of wills at the end. I mean, who, who's going to make a mistake? Who's going to do something? And obviously, uh, Dulcini left one on the plate, and Contra doesn't need much of a mistake to make a pay. Nine-inning affair, great way to start the series. Yeah, um, it was a great way to start, and I think it kind of really you know, showed us. You know, We were watching – Dulcini against OU, and she gave them fits too. Looked just like that, and um, we um, we looked about the uh, same. She's really good. Was really impressed. Um, she understands how to use the zone low. Um, she she throws a lot of pit, p- p- pitches that appear to be sh- strikes that aren't. Um, that appears to the hitters and umpires. So um, that that the umpiring was good, uh, but but I think if they went back and watched, there's some balls there that aren't aren't strikes and and our hitters feel the same way um and there are some that are strikes so it's very very good she's got a very good way um of um of pitching so uh, but we just found enough you know we found enough and and uh kelly was so good we made plays um and it was really cool to see well and yeah, i think you even alluded to this prior to the series but iacopo so good at framing pitches back there she's always moving uh, hitting her glove before the pitch. Uh, there's a little gamesmanship going on there. <laughs> Sounds like I co- Copo gets under your skin. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, she doesn't your kids, and that's good. But, you know, obviously she does do a lot of those things and, the, and, and get some of those calls. All right, so you get the win. We go into Saturday. It's supposed to be on ESPN2. Going to be a big broadcast. Uh, finally, some people that know what they're doing broadcast-wise are coming in to call the true, game. True, true. And, and, but it doesn't happen. Obviously, the tornado sirens, the lightning, um, you go inside, downside, and Gallagher Iba to, to kind of wait it out. I mean, that's a little different. It's one thing to have a rain delay, lightning delay. It's a little different when the sirens go off and we really got to move. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, like I, I, I had some re- recruits that called me and said, what the heck is going on there? <laughs> I told them, and I could feel them asking me some questions like, does this happen a lot? And I'm like, uh, it doesn't actually happen a lot. I've lived here for close to 30 years now, and um, – you know, I've only been in a shelter maybe a handful of times, yeah. right? And mm-hmm. uh, I've never personally like seen a real tornado. I've seen yeah. some looks like circulation or something very far away, but nothing that's ever been close to me. So I know that there's people that have, and it's a very scary and real thing. So, um, you know, we went into to shelter. I think we're probably set up to have one of the biggest crowds that we've ever had. 
Uh, we had the who's who in the stands with baseball getting moved up to, to an earlier time. It opened up some pe people that don't normally get a chance to come to come. And um, it was shaping up to be awesome. And before we could throw the first pitch, you know, we get that to get the siren. So um, I know when the uh, police officer walked in and said, I've got you, you need to come with me. I was like, uh, this is different. <laughs> so um, uh, I got my family with those guys. I was able to help get people wrangled up and get over there. And obviously it was, it was okay, but it was just an interesting experience and bummer. It's a bummer yeah. on the way it, you know, it kind of happened. Yeah, you know, it, it was different. And, okay, so let's talk about this is one of the most interesting things to me for people that don't get a chance to always see. Well, first off, Taylor Tuck was doing some great weather reports. Uh, Nader, Nader weather going on out Nader there. Weather. The funniest part about the video that she did when you guys were down there was, was seeing actually Miranda Ellis from Crown Point, Indiana. I would think she knows a little bit about tornadoes. She looked, she, she looked like this is the first time I have ever been in this situation. It looked like a brand new experience to her. Well, I think it, it was probably a little bit new to her, but what a lot of people don't know, and you know, I'm going to tell everybody now, is on the way down to, um, to shelter, she fell down the stairs and uh, uh, landed on her tailbone, um, kind of had to brace herself um, to not make the fall worse. We actually had to send her to, to the emergency room to go get an x-ray on her tailbone to make sure that wasn't broke. So we had a lot going on. I think that may have been more of her look than being worried about a tornado. She was worried if she was gonna be able to play or not uh, once we got everything under control. So we're dealing with that right now. Um, but um, you know, it, it was um, the, the beautiful thing about coaching is these kids are just incredible people and they are very smart and they're witty and when they start doing stuff sometimes as adults we look at them and go what are they doing right now right you just sit there and go oh my gosh but their reach is is pretty good and people love to see what these people are like these student athletes are like on a day-to-day -day basis and taylor tuck and this whole team great people they're funny and then when they do that kind of stuff the difference is we're over there having fun and texas was sitting next to us over there very quiet very um you were in the same facility we were both in the weight room oh we were on goodness. the we were on what would be the uh uh southwest side and they were on the <laughs> northwest side all huddled up we were kind of laughing and giggling and having fun and making videos and they were over there on their phones not talking to each other so um hey it is what it is that just sh shows you that you can win very different ways explains why they were saying we're going to have a squatting contest to see who gets the dub because texas literally was there with you i didn't realize yeah. well, that we would have won that well I listen it's pretty obvious brie was a state all state yeah. power lifter yeah we have some people that could squat the gym yeah so there was like okay simpson there were some kids yeah. that were getting called on yeah. that day we're fine here yeah no we they wanted to have a dance off like our girls were wanting to have a, a dance off and i was like eh, i'm not ready for that yet yeah, so, yeah 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 obviously though it uh again so you you get out of that you find out you're not going to have a game going to have a double header on saturday it's interesting i know you're not a fan of double headers mike white wasn't a fan of double header you, you accept it and you move on but you just never know how that's going to go. But you guys came out uh, on, on Sunday morning, that first game. And speaking of Miranda Ellis, I mean, she was brilliant. Got in a couple of jams, got herself out of those jams, did a few things, uh, pitched extremely well, hit the home run. I mean, against your old team, yeah, you couldn't have scripted it any better. It's wild. My eyes kind of water right now just thinking about the whole thing. Like, I, I honestly didn't know she was going to be able to, to play. And I saw her take BP, and I was like, ugh, that did not – it, it was gross, okay? <laughs> like, it was – you could tell that her, her upper uh, – let me just call it – her upper her upper butt and back, lower back were just in a knot mm. and sore. And so um, I looked at her and I said, hey, what do you think about just pitching? And she kind of looked at me and said, I'm either going to do both or I'm not going not gonna, not gonna to play. And I'm like – Okay, so <laughs> I just, from that point on, we didn't have any doubts. We kind of, we did start her in the flex, which was a little bit d different. We usually have her just in the DP and I make this switch the plate, but I was worried that I, did, I wanted her to, if she could only do one thing, I'd rather have her pitch. And I can remember in the third inning, I, I, uh, I looked at Coach Shippy. she sits right next to me and I said, you know, this is one of, this is one bad B. Like she is one 
tough cat. And she was just grinding, and she was so good. Maybe the best performance of the whole year, under c- control, gets out of the third inning jam and then hits the big home run. Um, they helped her a bit. Their coach is running their mouth just a, just a bit, um, and it got her. You, don't, you do not want to give this kid extra emotion. I'm always trying to give her it. I'm always trying to put it in her, and he gave it to her, mm. and she gave it back and then answered, and I was like, you shouldn't have woke the giant up. And um, <laughs> it was really cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, you know, I get it. It's, there's a lot of history and a lot of time, but they all, everybody handled it well, both sides. It was re- really cool. She's an amazing kid, amazing performance, and it was really cool to watch. But came in and poked the bear, and that's what happens. All right, so, so obviously the injury uh, on, a, on a pitch, she's about 10 feet up above the net, above, and, and we, at that point, that's when you realize, okay, something's not right there. And that became very obvious, and obviously that's still to be determined. You bring in Maxwell, 2-1 count, gets the last two uh, strikes. Okay, we win it, move to game three. I felt like there was a ton of momentum on your side, but the Elish thing kind of seemed to hang there for a minute, almost like, okay, let's, you know, that's a big deal. That's yeah. a really big deal. It's not about this next game only right now. Now yeah. it's what's going to happen the rest of the way. And so I think fans, everybody maybe kind of felt that in the stadium. But then you go with Morgan Dave. Now here's what I was going to say to you. When you think you know about the program, again, I'm, I know 20% about what's happening in Cowgirl softball. You won't let me know 21%. You hold me at 20. <laughs> Whatever. So when, when I'm looking at that Morgan Day coming in, I'm going, okay, Miranda Ellis is hurt. we got to make sure that there's a softball match uh, series with Florida State, Oklahoma. They need to give Morgan Day some more time here so that she can be developed and ready in case Ellis is not. And then I talked to you after the game, and my speculation was 100% wrong. She was on the slate no matter what. Yeah, so what we talked about before the, uh, before the first game, or before the second game on Sunday, we talked about this be- be- before. Uh, on, ga- on game days like this, there's a lot of recruits and families in town, so I get pulled some different ways to kind of uh, make sure we, you know, we say hi to those kids and make sure they feel important. It's a big deal. So I was doing a little bit bit of that after we hit um i came back inside and jeff and john were talking and i was like what are you two talking about um because it looked like they kind of when i walked in there they kind of (laughs) stopped so i said what are you talking about they said well we just have an idea not sure you're gonna like it but but we think it's a pretty good plan i said what's the plan well if we win this first game we need to throw morgan day no matter what like we're gonna throw her against florida state we're gonna probably need her against ou without a doubt um, this is before we even knew anything about mm-hmm. Ellis, right? So, mm-hmm. um, and she needs the uh, work. Uh, we need all three of them to have make a d- deep run. It's what it is. It's just part of this. So, um, we just decided then when this first game, Morgan Day goes, and um, and I was like, I'm in. I like it. I think it's right. We're still gonna have to beat the last series. We're gonna have to win two out of three, no matter what, if you want to win the league. Mm-hmm. So it didn't matter about that. And then when you start thinking like that, you're really, you're thinking about what's best for the program. And this is what's best for the program. It's what's best for Morgan Day. It gives her the confidence. We are, we told her that she already knew. So it wasn't like a last minute deal. So now she's not going, well, this happened. So now I'm going to get, no, no, no. That was already planned. Mm -hmm. Um, We had a plan. It was senior day. We wanted to get every senior in these games, no matter what. And to be able to get Jules Callahan and Michelle Richburg, who haven't been getting as much time, Jules gets a lot of time because she pinch runs a lot. Right. She's had more at bats th- th- this year than she than than she's had. She deserves them. She works her tail off every every, every day. Um, she gives us everything. Great teammate. Um, Michelle's had a good history here. It's been a hard year, uh, but she's had some great moments here. You know what I mean? It is what it is. So, it was just beautiful. You and I talked last night. And um, it's beautiful when plans come together <laughs> and you still win and you beat a, a, an, an opponent that you beat 14 out of the last 16 that I don't think still respects us. It's wild. Um, and it is what it is. So you just do what you got to do. You, you, if you're truly just worried about the inside of your program and if the walls are, are, are padded enough and people feel safe um, 
and they trust. It's really cool, and that's what happens. Winning is a byproduct of all of that. Well, and, and again, to be able to get all the seniors on on senior day, great senior moment afterwards, uh, great you know, conversation you had with those with the fans and with those seniors and their families, which was awesome as well. So you win, you get it. By the way, the car wild catch to end it, holy smokes, on the fly, right field, ball drifting, trying to get in foul territory, trying to get out. She hits it, catches it, collects it, hits the wall, hangs on. I mean, it was just, it was just, it, it just had great drama all the way around. That's the way you want to play. You only scored eight offensive runs and beat a top-notch Texas team. Tells you just how terrific the pitching and the defense really was this weekend. Well, the defense was really good except for two innings when we looked like a carnival <laughs> act. Um, we all we lacked was a tent and some dancing bears, and if the, the and the dancing bears would have really like stole the show. But yeah. we looked like clowns for Morgan Day, um, catching some fly balls, we're running into each other, not communicating, lost the ball in the sun. That's that can happen. Um, we let a ball in left field uh, drop that we didn't communicate on. So that's kind of got under my skin. I don't, I'm, I, I, I'm better in my seventh year. I only kind of screamed once and I, <laughs> I didn't throw anything. Um, but it took all I had to get up from my chair, walk to the end of the dugout and walk back and not say anything. It took all I had because these kids are so talented, and when we don't communicate, that is under my skin. So, that was an amazing catch. Um, she's fearless. The catch that Avery Hobson made was fearless. And we have to play like that to win these games. You, it comes down to one play. It comes down to little things, and it's usually not a big hit. It's not giving them an extra base. Mm -hmm. We did that all weekend long, shy. Um, stopped Iacopo from getting to second base on a ball hit off the wall. Um, she had no chance. It was thrown perfect. Carwell throws a ball in home that was just a perfect throw that we kept him at first and third. Some amazing things. The Cheyenne factor catch. <clears throat> now, she threw the ball up the line in center field, but she was racing yes. on the run. If they score there, changes their, their confidence level. And sure. You guys, you just, you never let them off the ropes in this thing. No, we played faster. It's the bottom line. We played faster and when you play fast for me as a coach coaching third base when a team is running around fast um, it makes you apprehensive at third like they should have tried to score Jefferson um, like last week I should have tried to score Ellish um, I didn't see the girl drop the uh, ball but she would have scored e easy and I held her up at third but when teams are playing fast it it's hard it's yeah. hard to make good decisions and so um, you have to be instinctual and it can happen to Dalva so just I'm proud of our team Cowgirls number one right now in the Big 12 standings. More about the Sooners next week because this week you go to Tallahassee. Listen, we're talking about regionals and super regional hosting, and you're going to play two teams that are also vying for that. So what a great opportunity in Tallahassee against Florida State, the team that knocked you out of the tournament last year. So this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. This is a really, if you're just a fan of the game, forget Florida State, Oklahoma State for a minute. Let's just say you're in I Iowa. And here, what this is the kind of matchup you want to see at this point in the season. Non-conference matchups that may be a precursor to what we see in Oklahoma City. Well, we've knocked each other out of the tournament the last two full seasons. We knocked them out in 19 um, after they had won the national title and they knocked us out of OKC last year. So um, I have a lot of respect for them. Um, they're really good. Um, we've got a good pitcher. Um, they have some experience. They have an Oklahoma, Oklahoma kid in Sydney, Cheryl, that plays third base that we never got a chance to recruit here. Um, unfortunately, I think they kind of have, have some Oklahoma State roots, so we, we never really got a chance to recruit before we got here, our, our staff. So it's a bummer deal, but good player. Um, their shortstop is a transfer from Tulsa that John coached and recruited, so it's wow. kind of got some interesting ties. Um, and you know it's going to be be a blast, and and you get to go down there and, and play in the fall. And, we're, and Thursday night we're on the ESPN national telecast, which is called the Thursday Night Throwdown. Um, so we'll be on that the next two weeks, which is really wow. cool. The only game on on Thursday night, um, so it'll be a prime time uh, game. And and um, and then we get OU, and and we get a chance to to do what we've done. I think the last five years we've had a chance to win that league, um, win our league in the last weekend. If we can 
outplay them. We haven't done that yet. So we get another opportunity. We put ourselves in that spot. Um, I don't think we've ever gone into a tied like this, which mm -hmm. is kind of cool. Um, so uh, this will be a really fun week uh, with Florida State, and it'll propel us into OU. And, um, and, and you know, this is like, I got a text for, from a buddy of mine last night, and he said, this weekend you get to play with house m m money. He goes, because you guys took some risk and scheduled this, you guys put yourself in the best spot. You guys are really with house money here. Um, how, how, I mean, I will love it. Like, let's, mm -hmm. let's go play. Like, let's just go <laughs> fight it out and there'll be great crowds. It'll be hot and sticky and all that kind of stuff. It's going to prepare us for what postseason is going to be like. Double down, double down. Oh, Get I it always done. double down. <laughs> I know you do. 10 and 11, I'm doubling. <laughs> doubling. I don't care what you got in your hand. There's a lot of things you learn from Holder. That, <laughs> that's that's right, one buddy. of them right you there. always double. <laughs> Coach, great job this weekend. Congratulations, and uh, best of luck in Tallahassee. Thank you. All right. With that, we need to step aside. When we come back, we're going to talk some baseball. Josh Holliday joins us on the Orange Power Podcast right after this. Hello, sweet babies. Welcome to your new home. You have changed our life, and you may even change the world. And because of you, 2021 is the best year ever. Mercy has helped moms deliver babies for nearly 200 years. To find out how to welcome your baby at Mercy, visit mercy.net slash osumom. At Academy Sports and Outdoors, bikes for the whole family are just a click away. Buy online at academy.com with our free in-store assembly. Your next set of wheels plus helmets, pads, and water bottles will be waiting for you at our in-store pickup counter. Get to the fun faster with our in-store pickup and free assembly at Academy Sports and Outdoors. Welcome back to the Orange Power Podcast. And again, uh, we are going to stay on the diamond sports. Let's talk a little baseball as Coach Josh Holiday joins us now. Coach, pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you on the show. I haven't seen you in a while, Casey. Good to have you. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's been fun to follow you guys. And, you know, Coach, a couple of things before we get into this last week, you guys were two and two. Um, th there's just a couple of things that I can't get over. And one is this. In, a, in an odd reason, a couple of reasons, I have been at Alley P a lot lately um, and just been around that stadium, and I love the nostalgia, still love it. It's got grass going in the warning track, and I just, I love it. But then I go to the TCU series uh, when I got a chance on Sunday and, and got a chance to see that, and I sit there and I see that ballpark. If you don't remember, it, it, just drive by Alley P, go, go take a quick little look, and then go to O'Brien and go, my lands. It is unbelievable how far the, the absolute facilities have come. Yeah, I actually <clears throat> drove by uh, Alley P uh, two days ago. About once every couple of months, I'll be going down Duck Street, and I'll just take that old turn to go through the Bennett Hall parking lot. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it's a reminder of where all this started. Uh, way back when that was University Field before it became Alley P. Mm -hmm. And then uh, obviously all the years of great memories, great teams, great people, uh, great uh, investment, great sacrifice made over there by a lot of awesome mm -hmm. people. Uh, and then you get to go over to Obrade Stadium and you realize how fortunate you are to um, have a state of the art <coughs> facility um, and how, um, how many people made that happen. And uh, it's just a very uh, important thing to never lose track to where you came mm -hmm. from, never lose uh, appreciation for what you have. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it's a, it's a statement about where this whole college athletics scene is going. And uh, the fact that our university continues to, to work so hard to put all of our sports in position to be successful says a lot about the leadership. And uh, the amazing supporters that we have that want to see Cowboy Athletics, Cowgirl Athletics, doesn't matter what sport you're in, continue to have opportunities to compete at the top, and uh, we appreciate that. But, yeah, it is a remarkable uh, change from 10 years ago when, a, <laughs> you know, a weekend series with the TCU here in Stillwater, what that looked like then and what it looks like now. It's uh, We've come a long ways. Yeah, you know, because I've left some uh, Cowgirl softball broadcast and then, you know, try to uh, sometimes make the game, sometimes maybe can't, but, but I'm driving down from the one venue to the other. And, 
And is, especially when it's an evening game, that, that jumbotron is fully lit, those lights are going, and that American flag is in full wave. It, it just gives me chills every time I see it. it ha and I, I like what you said there. Don't lose appreciation. You know, sometimes after two or three years, ah, it's just what we do. Man, go stand at Alley P. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not there, go stand at Alley P and then go back. Yeah, I think that American flag, when you mentioned some of the things that really stand out that, that kind of capture your attention mm -hmm. um, and maybe bring you full, uh, full center. Uh, when you stand there and you see that flag, uh, you mentioned the way the facility looks at night, the way it's mm -hmm. lit up. It's beautiful. It's so mm -hmm. well done. Um, yeah, those things grab you. They, uh, they, they, they grab your attention. They make you realize what other people have been willing to invest so that you can be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, kids love playing there. Obviously, we've had tremendous fan turnout, and uh, the student body's been remarkable. The you know we've had some games where we've had as many as 2,000 students attending mm -hmm. baseball games. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, just a an unbelievable thing mm -hmm. to see because there was probably a a lot of times that number was 200 in the old days, and now you're getting almost 2,000 students on certain nights of the week. So just really remarkable growth. Yeah, we know what student fans do for any venue it's incredible okay so another philosophical question you know i don't know if i've ever asked you this um end of a ball game whether you did well you didn't do well what's the stat you look at when you think about football there are coaches are always going to say well who won the battle of the turnovers in mm -hmm. basketball who won the rebounding battle for a baseball game whether you won or lost it was a close where did we lose this game what's the stat that you go to well, that's a great question. I don't know if there's any one stat, but I think the air column will usually tell you a little bit about how the game was played. Was it played clean? Was it played tight? Was it played close? Uh, when you play good baseball and, you, and you're air free or the airs are limited, uh, that's usually going to tell you a little bit about a one run game or a close game because when you give the other team extra outs, normally that costs you. Then I think you probably shift your focus to uh, how many balls did we put in play versus our strikeouts and, and vice versa. Did we. Uh, did we keep them from getting free passes, limit the walks? Uh, and then it usually comes down to just a pivotal pitch mm -hmm. or a pivotal play mm -hmm. across nine innings that you could look back at and say in the seventh inning when we had second, third, one out, we put the ball in play and got a run home. Or, you know, um, they did a great job of bringing a guy out of the bullpen and we had something going and getting a double play mm -hmm. ball. So there's usually pivotal moments in a game that you can put your finger on that if you could have won that moment, it might have shifted momentum or changed the final score. But I think usually if you're going to try to isolate a column, you know, you can win some games with low hit total mm -hmm. uh, and you can win some games with low run total, but rarely do you win a lot of baseball games with a, a high error total. And I think when you play good defense, you give yourself a really good chance to be in the game start to finish. Let me ask you this. What about left on the bags, LOBs? I mean, yeah. you know, it's one of those, is that one that can be inflated and, and, and doesn't really tell the story or is that one that you look at the end and go yeah i mean we left we left nobody on or we left way too many on well it's it's definitely can tell you how the the flow of the game went you know there'll be some ball games where you know you might be facing a tough customer on the mound and you do a really good job of getting a guy or two on base mm -hmm. or even a couple of guys on base but that that guy on the mound knows how to make a pitch when he needs it so i, I think it tells you were you were you competitive and were you putting yourself in position um obviously the two out hit the two out RBI is a, is a deal breaker when it comes to uh, beating a really good pitcher because mm -hmm. those guys know how to hunker down. You look at like a Justin Campbell, for instance, people's batting average against him with runners in scoring position is, is tiny. And that's because he knows how to go to another level uh, and make a pitch or two where he has to reach back or, or really just dial in. So the two out RBI base hits a huge one. Um, you, can, you can win a ball game with uh, efficiency in those categories. Um, if you have a lot of guys on base, but at the end of the day you look and say, hey, Cowboys left 14 runners on base, it tells you you didn't quite finish some innings. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all, uh, yes, their totals. And I think the other thing, too, is avoiding hitting into double plays. Double plays <coughs> are offensively, they can really take the juice out of what you got going on. You build an inning, you get some guys in the right spot, boom, you hit into a double play, and it kind of takes the wind out of your sails. So I would think the double play ball is also part of that philosophical thing of, of looking at things as an offense that you say, <coughs> you got to stay away from the double play. Yeah, you know, I, again, I've just never asked that question. Just curious when you go to the box score, what you check out. You mentioned Justin Campbell. Let's go to just go to Friday night against TCU. 14 strikeouts, yeah. co Big 12 pitcher of the week. I mean, the young man is, I know you and Dave have been talking a lot about him, and, and rightfully so. He just doesn't disappoint. 
Yeah, he was terrific. I mean, he competed at an elite level. His stuff was really good. His execution was even better, and his competitiveness is always uh, highest uh, highest caliber. So another remarkable outing by Justin. He was fantastic. Second game, so you get the win, a uh, good win, 13-2. Obviously, the weather, fear of weather, and it was a good decision, as it turns out, to move the game up to get it in there. Uh, so you had to play a little bit earlier, turn right back around pretty quickly and get back out there. And another good ball game and against, an obviously, a very good TCU team. Yeah, um, you know, just didn't quite get uh, into the flow of the game early, fought back, hung in there a little bit. You know, that was one of those games that was a little bit of a momentum game. You know, we had all the momentum in night number one. I think they felt uh, kind of a fresh start in day two. They came after us a little bit early. But we gave ourselves a chance. You know, anytime you're <clears throat> bringing the tie and run to the plate late, and uh, you know you go get to their closer, you get to their top reliever. Uh, the guys did a good job of fighting the last pitch, which set us up for a pivotal game three on Sunday, and uh, unfortunately, a little bit uh, more of the same. Yeah, you know, again, uh, so you you fall in this one six to four, and then going to Sunday's game again, raced over after the cowgirl broadcast, got a chance to see your final inning and a half, two innings. And this TCU team just clawed a couple down late, scratched across a couple. Yeah. And, and But you guys really set yourselves up nicely in the bottom. I, I, I As I sat there and watched, and just the expectation of your program, because it has been so good, okay, let's see that hit. Let's see that game-winning hit, that walk-off. Yeah. And gave yourselves a chance. Yeah, you know, um, Bryce gave us a good start. We were in a pretty good spot. We, we had a, a ball jump over our mitt down at first base. Griff came off the bag, and it looked like it was destined for his glove. And, a little bit of a higher hop, but he'd tell you he should have had that ball. Which, so we opened the door for him to slide back in there a little bit. What they did a really good job of is they continued to add a run here, add a run there in innings seven, eight, and nine. And uh, our guys had a, another push left in them. We were in position uh, both in the eighth and the ninth. <clears throat> and uh, I love the way we hung in there and fought. I love the opportunity we created for something magical to happen. We just didn't quite get that one magic swing. The guys that run out of the bullpen late in the game have really good stuff, so they make that challenging because mm -hmm. the ball's moving fast and it's breaking sharp. But uh, disappointed, yes, <clears throat> we wanted that series. We felt like we were in position to get it. Uh, TCU uh, got off the mat, you know, after putting them in a, a tough spot on Friday night. They responded Saturday and Sunday and got the best of us. So you look at those things, you figure out how to improve, clean it up, you um, go to work right away which is the only choice you have because we were right back on the diamond on Tuesday night in Wichita and uh, there's no time to sit around and sulk. Uh, you got to flip the switch and you got to figure out how to <clears throat> put your, uh, your cleats back on, put your hat back on, get in that competitive mindset and uh, take on the next challenge, which was a Wichita State over in Wichita and then uh, University of Texas this weekend down in Austin. Well, you know, it, it's <coughs> always, coaches are always saying, you know, you guys talking about, well, how do you respond? Well. Uh, you guys responded with a sweep and a split series with Wichita State. And they didn't make it easy. They, it's not like you guys walked out there and just knocked them uh, all around. It was a one game that you had to be very engaged in, stayed in. Eventually you won pretty w handily, but, but it was a pretty good ball game all the way through. Yeah, you know, Wichita State I think is a much better team than their record would indicate. They've hit a pretty tough stretch here. Uh, I think their last 20 games have been really an uphill climb for them. But uh, when the three-game series started, you know, a month ago, I think they were sitting at 13 and 10. They'd won a, a nice tournament down in Arlington, and they were getting ready to dive into American Athletic Conference, kind of the, the, the meat of their schedule. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some darn good baseball <coughs> in the American Athletic Conference, and they've hit some tough weekends. So um, to sweep a three-game series spread out over about five weeks of time at midweek is, is tough to do. I'm proud of the way we handled it. I like the way we swung the bat last night. We got a lot of different guys to the mound. So, uh, good win for us. Now we got to pack up the bus and, and head down to Austin, Texas, and take on a very good Texas team. Before we talk about that one, um, that series, real quickly, the Big 12. You guys are tied for the top in winning percentage. You're a series behind TCU. Uh, number 20 in the country is TCU. You guys, number eight. Tex, number nine. Texas, number 10. Um, and I think if you if you ask anybody that really pays attention to this conference, they would have said those four teams are going to be beating each other up for a great chance to win the regular season and certainly to win the Big 12. And that has not uh, – that has truly transpired. That is four fantastic programs. And in right now, it's a matter of just surviving that gauntlet, right? Every, each time these, series, these teams face each other, yeah. it really is. You don't know who's going to take two out of three. Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at the uh, fact that Texas was the number one ranked team in the country for – 
four, five, six weeks early. Mm -hmm. uh, tells you, you know, the uh, preseason reputation of this particular group of Texas players. They're a college World Series team from a year ago, and, and they got off to a really good start as the season's gone on. The challenging schedule that our conference offers has, uh, you know, hung a few L's on their record, but uh, they're still outstanding. You mentioned a TCU team coming off a weekend up here in Stillwater where they played very well against us. I think at the time, I think we were ranked as high as two. Uh, you look at the body of work our kids have put together, and then you talk about Texas Tech. So you got four teams there that at any point in the season, depending on where you're looking, we're sitting somewhere in that one, two, five, seven, nine, ten range in the rankings. So they're very good teams, teams that are recognized nationally as uh, well-built teams, good pitching, good defense, good offense. And uh, you're going to take your lumps every now and then when you're going head-to-head -head with top ten teams. I don't care who you are. Those are, uh, those are tough games for a reason. And uh, – I think the preseason kind of view of our, our conference has been pretty accurate because not only <clears throat> have the four teams you mentioned been pretty good, I like the season West Virginia's put together. I think Oklahoma's put together a good season, and, and Kansas State has uh, played much better as of late. So a lot of good baseball teams, a lot of tough games, a lot of tough, tough games ahead. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's back and forth. It's neck and neck. It's tough. It's good competition. It's uh, some of the best – players, teams, and, and certainly uh, most well-coached teams that you're going to run into. Well, and obviously you got to love these moments, right? And you guys have one of those this weekend in Austin against a very good Texas team. And, um, again, this is one that uh, obviously you guys are capable of winning. You could sweep, win the series. But the other could be true, too. Is so it, it really – let's go back to those stats we were talking about before. we got to rebound well. We get, can't yeah. handle – got to win the battle of the turnovers. That's, that's the kind of series that this will be this weekend in Austin. Well, I think – when you look at uh, traditionally going to places like Austin, going to Lubbock, going to Fort Worth, going and taking on some of the very best teams in our conference on the road, you have to embrace the environment that you know you're going into. You have to know these games are going to be difficult. And you have to kind of tell yourself mentally there's a certain level we have to get to in terms of execution and competitiveness that's required. Mm -hmm. And when you can do that going in, you can really test yourself and see where you're at as a competitor. And I think that's really – what we've talked to our players about, uh, we prepared them for this by taking on a pretty challenging, ambitious early season schedule. And uh, we've been able to go to Austin multiple times and play extremely well there and win series. And so we have uh, what it takes, um, what you're looking for every single time you, you take on a weekend is that the team rises to the occasion and that the players bond together and recognize this is what it's going to take this weekend to get the job done. And uh, our kids have done a pretty good job of that. You know, when you look at the, um, the weekend series battle, uh, the loss to TCU stung. That was only the second weekend series we've lost this season. So they've taken on the weekends with a great amount of uh, courage and confidence and done a pretty good job at it. But the remainder of the schedule is going to demand that we continue to do that and elevate our game. So that's kind of where we're at as a group. And uh, I like the kids a lot. I really enjoy this particular team, and, and I think we're going to keep getting better. It's good stuff. Friday night, 6.30. Saturday, 2.30. Sunday, 1 o'clock. All three games on the Longhorn Network. Coach, always appreciate the time sitting down to talk to you, and best of luck the rest of the way. Good to see you, Casey. Thank I you. appreciate it, Coach. All right, with that, let's uh, take a break. When we come back, when you say student athlete, Stephanie Helson is as epitome of that as you could possibly have representing the Oklahoma State Cowgirl Equestrian Team. She'll join us on set coming up next as we continue with the Orange Power Podcast. At og and the energy we deliver is more than electrical. We energize the future by balancing our efforts to provide the lowest rates possible with our responsibility to protect the environment for future generations. That's why we've strengthened our power grid through new technologies, leading to a 40% reduction in CO2 emissions, which, when combined with our rates, makes us an industry leader. Because at og and we do more than energize a power grid. At og and we energize life. Welcome back, football fans. We'll see you in the fridge. Welcome back to the Orange Power Podcast, and we are joined now by Stephanie Helson, national champion, 
Stephanie Helson and Scholar Athlete of the Year. Stephanie, it is a pleasure to have you with us on the show. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. You know, it, it's, it is, um, it's been such an incredible year. So many things I want to talk to you about. But just describe for us to start with that, that the moment that the announcement was made, you won the final point and the championship was yours. What was it like for everybody? Um, it was, <laughs> man, I didn't think I would get emotional, but um, we watched the last ride. It was at Sid Zig. She had the last ride, and we knew she had it. Um, she had a beautiful ride, and we knew the score she was going against, and I was listening. Like, usually the Western girls, we kind of sit next to a hunt seat girl and try and listen up to what they're saying as they go, and so we knew we had it. We got down, like, past the bleachers, ready to run out as soon as the <laughs> score came out. And so and s as soon as they announced that and announced that we won, we just, like, stormed the field, <laughs> I guess you could say. We stormed the arena. So yeah. it was pretty awesome. Yeah, that, that video was awesome to see you guys. And then there was, of course, a, a, a s section of girls that were listening and huddled, waiting for the announcement. That video was cool. Mm -hmm. And you guys came running in. Okay, I, I want to talk more about that, and we'll get there. But let's go back, okay? all the way back to Washington, right? Talk to me about growing up in Washington and, and how you got into equestrian. Yeah, so I like to say I was kind of born into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, my parents both just trained horses ever since I was little and my um, dad still does that for a living. My mom did it for a living up until I was probably in middle school almost. And then she moved um, and kind of changed life paths a little bit but my um, dad still does that mm -hmm. and I just grew up in it and I think a lot of kids that grow up in that kind of situation they either love horses <laughs> or they hate them and uh, luckily I loved it and it was just it's always been my passion so that's kind of the short answer and so and, and you mentioned uh, you know I was talking to you earlier before we went on you said you kind of get family across the country well I was told that you even have a grandfather that still uses draft horses to farm yeah really T tell me about that yeah grandpa jack um <laughs> he is in wyoming so my mom lives in the same town as him now and um in the summers i try and go there as much as i can to help him but he just i mean he's very old school he doesn't have a cell phone <laughs> he um <laughs> tries his hardest to never have to be on a computer or <laughs> talk on like <laughs> even the house phone but he has just done that forever um he calls himself retired now but i don't think you can really even consider him <laughs> retired he used to log with horses actually too as well and he wow. has built hundreds of log structures and log homes of just like entryways log houses and cabins and barns and things and he used to use horses to log in the woods and then in the summertime he would also use them to cut and rake hay and then we've um we've had a square baler and a tractor that we used to actually put the hay into bales mm -hmm. um but the cutting and raking part we use the horses still and he just can't justify buying all of the new equipment when he already <laughs> has his old equipment and his horses and it's what he loves to do it's kind of just it's kind of like a hobby i think too that's awesome and so when you go there w what is your job in the summer uh i guess just about everything i mean i can do pretty much everything with the horses from you know hooking them up and harnessing them he is like in his a early 80s now <laughs> and still doing it so um he says it takes him as long to harness so get all of the gear on the horse now one horse as it used to take him to harness like seven wow, wow. <laughs> so me and my mom usually try and do most of that stuff because it's he has two shoulder re replaced shoulders and <laughs> trying to throw those things over the horse's back backs is a lot so we try and get there and um get most of that done and then we actually drive a team each of us my mom my grandpa and i which is a team of two horses probably for depending on how long they've been doing it like where we're at in the summer mm -hmm. anywhere from an hour to three hours wow. give them a break you know take the harness off for lunch and let them eat and drink water and then either get three new teams and start back up for the afternoon or maybe even use the same ones again, just depending on <laughs> how 
in shape they are, but then, you know, you cut the hay, you let it dry, then you rake. And usually my grandpa will drive the baler with the tractor because my mom and I don't know anything <laughs> about tractors, but we can handle horses. So we'll rake and my grandpa will bale. And then depending on where we're at, um, sometimes we pick up the bales and stack them or take them. And sometimes the owners of the property will do that. It just depends. Wow. That, I mean, that is old school. That's <laughs> yeah. really old school. And you grew up in FFA, right? I did. So I, I mean, I took ag classes. Um, I grew up in a dairy town in Washington. And so um, in relative to the Seattle area, my school was a small school, but mm -hmm. there was still about, like, I mean, there's over a thousand kids in my graduating mm -hmm. class. Wow. So relative to Oklahoma, that's probably not small to us. It was a small farm mm -hmm. dairy kid town and we did have ag classes in FFA and I was a part of that. Well, and, you know, it's interesting because oftentimes FFA kids, they're well-spoken, they know how to give speeches, they know how to handle themselves. And when you look at your education and the awards that you have received, I, I, I would think that you probably would attribute some of that to some of the training you had through FFA. I would definitely say so. I used to be terrified to, you know, <laughs> speak publicly, and it's um, definitely something that started in FFA, and I've been able to get a lot better throughout the years, I think. Well, and talk about, again, you're a student athlete. Mm -hmm. um, it's obvious, and, and it's typically true of Oklahoma State Equestrian, and maybe every equestrian program, but when it comes to academic awards, you guys sweep a lot of awards. I mean, you're always there representing uh, so extremely well. And for you, the, the 2022 Female Scholar Athlete of the Year, what did that mean to you? It was a huge um, surprise, and it was a huge honor. Um, I, I did not expect any of that. <laughs> um, going to that banquet, I thought, you know, maybe if I just don't go, no one will notice. Like normally <laughs> you, you hand people your tickets, like graduation, and you walk across the stage if you hand them the ticket. And right. I thought, you know, maybe if I don't go, it'll be okay. <laughs> and I'm sure glad that <laughs> I pulled myself together and decided to go. <laughs> so yeah, I was very surprised and excited well and you're a former Gerald Lage award winner as well the the, the biggest uh, scholar, uh, academic award given by the Big 12 <laughs> I mean so obviously you take academics extremely seriously yeah and I in high school um, there was a program called running start and I was able to start taking college classes in high school um, during my last two years. And so I think I kind of came into OSU with a little bit of he a head start on a lot of those basic college classes. And I think that's helped a lot, honestly. Well, and so that's the academic side, kind of gets us up to speed going into this season. And so you're a former Big 12 writer of the year. So uh, again, so it's, it's, you have had great success in the arena and obviously off in, in the classroom. And then I started looking at some things, getting ready for this interview, and I, and I saw your first ride of the year was in the national championships, and I went, oh, wait a minute, was she hurt? I don't remember anybody saying she was ever hurt. And so I called Coach Sanchez, and he said, yeah, it's a little unique. Tell us, you were student teaching this year, so you weren't riding up until the very end. How on earth, talk about how this even came to be. Yeah, that's a, it's a long answer, <laughs> but so, for my degree in ag education, I did need to student teach in order to complete that degree. And I guess the silver lining of COVID is we got a fifth year mm -hmm. of eligibility. And I was lucky and blessed for um, Larry to allow me to use my scholarship and continue to student teach um, while being on the team, but also having to be away for a semester. So it was a semester long student teaching. And so I went and did that in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and I loved it. It was great. And so I finished my my bachelor's degree in ag education in December. And then, um, you know, last spring, I had talked to Coach Larry and Coach Laura both about kind of this year and what it would look like. And I told um, Coach Laura, you know, I've already put off student teaching for a while for the team. And as much as I'd love to ride, I'd also, you know, I think student teaching will probably help me towards my future a little bit more by finishing up <laughs> that degree. And so I decided on that and then kind of talked about like 
I do have a little bit of an interest in becoming an equestrian coach. Mm -hmm. And so this semester, she told me that I could be, I guess it would be labeled as a volunteer coach. And so that's actually what I was doing most of the semester. And I would sit, I wouldn't say I was <laughs> really a coach. I was still, you know, teammates and friends with all the girls on the team and still technically a part of the roster and eligible. So I was more of, I guess, I think I would say a shadow to Coach Laura, and I learned a ton from her. I was still riding in practices all semester long and um, around the barn for actually four practices a day instead of just <laughs> one because I was shadow shadowing Co Coach Laura. And then um, at the end of – right after Big 12s, actually, I had no idea that – Laura and Larry had been thinking about asking me to compete. And um, Laura called me in after Big 12s, and I thought, oh, no, like, <laughs> I must have done something <laughs> wrong. I was so worried. <laughs> and she's like, don't worry, you're not in trouble. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So she came in, and she's like, how do you feel about um, competing at nationals? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I just did not see it coming, but I um, just felt really passionately that I wanted to do what whatever was best for the team. I mean, so, so deeply, I don't really know how else to explain it. So whatever, I just told her if that's what you think is best, you know? And um, <laughs> I think on a lot of teams, that would have been really, really hard and maybe even impossible, but it was a huge testament to what our team is really about and what our team is. And um, <clears throat> I think you would hear this a lot from other girls, but it is a family. And I think with any other group of girls, I probably would have had the hardest time mentally, but they were so supportive and so, you know, excited for me to go in and show again. So it was really awesome and a huge testament to yeah. who they are as people. And I don't think you can understate that. So coach told me I, I brought in the captains and I had to get, you know, hey, make sure they were on board with this. And he said, extremely. Then he had to call in a young lady that was not going to be competing because you were going to be competing. And she said, Coach, that's probably the right decision. She was so on board, said, you know, I understand and I'll get through it. No, she said, that's the right decision. Um, and then obviously got to go to you and then to have the rest of the team be involved. It does tell you the team chemistry on this team was really, really good. And you, you told me we felt like we were capable of winning this championship all along, every one of my years. But this year was – you did it. Mm -hmm. That kind of chemistry and willingness tells you just how special this team really was. I think so. I mean, that girl that I ended up showing for, as soon as she came out of her meeting with the coach, she came out and gave me a great big hug, and <laughs> she just said, I love you, Steph. And <laughs> – I mean, that really meant a lot. Sure, I, I, I mean, there's no way it doesn't. And so you get a chance to compete. You obviously competed in all for three of the final three uh, matches, and it results in a championship. Let's go back to that moment. To be able to celebrate that, you know, a volunteer coach, even though you're friends, is a different title than a teammate. And to be able to come back and share that had to be extremely special again. It was, and it honestly felt like I had been there the whole time, <laughs> the way they brought me in and supported me as a teammate. You got to ho hoist the trophy. You've got two degrees. You're working on a master's. You can teach. You can coach. You can train. Uh, you can gr drive draft horses. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for you? What, 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 what do you eventually think? Do you know yet? You know, we were talking about your sister. And you said, man, my, you know, kids change so much. I'm not sure what she's going to do. You know, at your point, you've got so many roads ahead of you. What do you think you want to do? After student teaching, I learned that I would totally love being an ag teacher. But um, I think throughout my time on the team, too, I've really seen how cool it is to be a coach and, like, how much <laughs> I look up to my coaches and how much sure. I've learned from them. And not in just the sport, but in life. And um, I've really – developed a huge passion for becoming a coach one day and so that's not a job that opens up frequently <laughs> um especially because there's not a whole lot of equestrian coaches it's not like soccer or something mm -hmm. like that but um it is something that I do have a dream of doing one day and I would really love to do it if I ever had that opportunity it's 2022 scholar athlete of the year that's the student part 
national champion. That's the athlete part, and it was an incredible run for you here. Congratulations on a great career and how well you represented Oklahoma State, but congratulations on that trophy as well. That's awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. That's going to do it for us. We want to say thanks to Stephanie for being here. We certainly want to say thanks to you as well. Our thanks to Josh Holliday and to Kenny Gajewski as well as that wraps up this show. We will catch you guys next time right back here for the Orange Power Podcast.